Welcome to the Evolution and Ecology Unit. We're starting off on a very cold day at the beginning of April. It's about one degree, but there's been enough sunshine over the last few days for the leaves to start appearing on the trees and also for the grass to start growing quite rapidly. And just behind you, uh, there's a field uh, with some oilseed rape, which was barely showing above the ground just three weeks ago, but now uh, it's round about half a metre tall, so growing like anything. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is the impact of sunlight on ecosystems. And the term ecosystem is just one of the terms that we're going to be exploring when we start the video. We'll be looking at various ecological terms so that we can use them. So I'll get back to the lab and we'll carry on with our investigation. Only a very small proportion of the energy leaving the sun can actually be made use of by plants in photosynthesis. Are things like shade, so if they're shaded by trees or by other plants or by their own leaves. The effects of cloud dissipating the sunlight, it won't filter it all out but it causes a considerable loss of sunlight. Orientation of the leaves, so some of the leaves will be facing away from the sun at any given time of the day. Others will be fully facing the sun and able to carry out maximum photosynthesis and some of them will be edge on. So that's a considerable difference in the amount of light energy that can be made use of. Obviously the latitude as well. Uh, at the equator the sun tends to be directly overhead uh, and if it's directly overhead it has to pass through a much thinner layer of atmosphere. You're probably aware that light leaves the sun at various wavelengths and the wavelength of light which is the visible spectrum is just a tiny part of the total solar energy leaving the sun. Either side of the visible spectrum we've got infrared, ultraviolet, radio waves, x-ray waves, microwaves and so on. And the only light that can be made use of by plants and indeed by us is the visible light part of the spectrum. So again a lot of the light reaching the Earth's surface can't be made use of by plants. And some of the light will be reflected. It could be reflected by the surface of the leaves or it could be reflected by particles in the atmosphere. And then of course not all of the light hits the chloroplasts. Some of the light passes right through the leaves uh, and therefore doesn't play a part in photosynthesis. And if you doubt that, just think what happens if you're in a forest uh, at midday with the sun fully blazing down on the leaf canopy. It's still light enough to be able to see something. It's not pitch dark in the forest, so some of the light is passing through. Let's just have a look at uh, what actually happens to the light energy that's produced and transformed by the plants into food energy or chemical energy. In any given ecosystem there are a number of feeding levels and we call those trophic levels, often abbreviated to TL. So right at the base of any food chain you've got the plants which we've just talked about. The plants in turn are eaten by herbivores which we call primary consumers and they're at trophic level 2. Secondary consumers are carnivores, these are animals which eat the primary consumers, the herbivores, TL3 and TL4. And TL4 is pretty much as high as you'll get in most terrestrial ecosystems. If you look over on the right hand side of the diagram here, um, the numbers just represent baseline figures for the amount of energy available from each trophic level. So if we say that plants are able to produce 
100 arbitrary units of energy. Only about a tenth of that, at most, is available to the herbivores. And the reason for that is that the plants have to use some of that energy that they've trapped themselves for growth and respiration and the production of material, storage material. The primary consumers in turn, let's say they receive 10 arbitrary units, uh, they also need to use some of that energy for their own respiration uh, and therefore respiration and production of inedible material. I've never tried eating the hooves of a cow uh, and basically other things will actually limit the amount of energy passed to trophic level three and the same things apply there that trophic level three will produce inedible material material that can't be reached or got hold of uh, and also of course respiration makes a huge difference so the third the TL4 trophic level four the third level consumers are only going to receive 0.1 arbitrary units and therefore this limits the number of tertiary consumers that you can have in any ecosystem and so what you tend to find is that the number of animals which are top predators are very much fewer than the amount of animals which are the herbivores you get this steady redu reduction uh, in numbers there's simply not enough energy to go around. And as it says at the top, don't talk about energy being lost at each trophic level. It's actually transformed. So energy is transformed between plants and herbivores. It's transformed into storage material, inedible material, uh, material that can't be eaten. Uh, and of course, respiration produces heat and kinetic energy uh, and so there are these transformations not losses now one of the things you need to be able to do is to carry out fairly simple energy flow calculations so I'm just going to go through one or two examples uh, and there should be some more examples appearing on Moodle shortly for you to practice on the percentage of energy which becomes available as the net primary production of green plants so what percentage of 3 by 10 to the 6 becomes available as the net primary production that's 1.8 by 10 to the 4 of plants and there's an equation which you can use for this um, so if you see the words available as put that on top of the equation line and on the bottom of the equation line the denominator uh, call that uh, the percentage of in this particular case and then you multiply the answer by a hundred and that gives you the percentage available put more simply it's output over input multiplied by a hundred so let's put some plug some numbers into that So basically, uh, uh, amount of incident sunlight goes on the bottom of the line. So there it is down the bottom, 3 by 10 to the 6. On the top of the line, the numerator, uh, basically that's 1.8 by 10 to the 4. Multiply the answer by 100. And if you're not up to speed on your powers of 10, uh, you can very easily convert those figures into real numbers. So basically 1.8 by 10 to the 4 uh, is the same as 1, 8 and 3 zeros. So one of the 10 to the 4s has been taken up by the decimal place. 3 by 10 to the 6 is 3 million. And so that comes out to 0.6%, a tiny proportion. Let's stick with the same, uh, the same um, sort of food web or food chain uh, and just do a different calculation. This time, um, 
let's calculate the percentage of the incident energy which becomes available to insectivorous birds. So instead of NPP, we're using insectivorous birds. So again, what we do this time, uh, calculate the percentage of incident energy, that's 100, which becomes available to 3 by 10 to the 6, 3 million, times 100, and that gives us 0.003%. Okay, you're getting the idea. Let's do one more. Percentage of the energy passed to caterpillars, which becomes available to insectivorous birds. So the amount of energy passed to caterpillars is 1,800. The amount available for insectivorous birds is 100. Let's plug them into the equation. Here we are. It becomes 100 divided by 1800, multiply the answer by 100, 5.55%. So again, less than 10% gets passed from the caterpillars, the primary consumers, to the insectivorous birds, the secondary consumers. As I said, you should find some examples on Moodle of uh, other thing, other food chains which you can use. But it's actually an oversimplification uh, to talk about food chains because in any real ecosystem, and particularly as you get further away from the equator, you find a much more complex picture. So this is a food web which you might find in a typical bit of woodland in the UK. The important thing to notice is that not only are there a lot more names on there, but also some of the organisms there are actually operating at more than one trophic level. So, for instance, if you look over on the right-hand side to the fox, uh, at certain times of the year the fox will actually feed directly on crab apples. However, at other times of the year, or indeed at the same time of the year, the fox may actually feed on wood mice and the wood mouse actually feeds on bluebells. So the wood mouse is a primary consumer. The fox is actually acting as a secondary consumer here. So it's at two levels already. Uh, if you look over a bit further, you'll see that foxes eat tree creepers, which eat caterpillars, which feed on oak trees. So what you're doing now is you're making the fox into a tertiary consumer. So lots and lots of different trophic levels involved there. Um, and trying to work them out can be quite a tangle. And an exercise which I'd like you to try, if you look on the PowerPoints on Moodle, uh, you're here, drawing a food web showing flows of energy. You're given some information and what you've got to try and do when you get a mobile, basically turn this into a food web, join the arrow, the different organisms with straight arrows, please, no curvy arrows. Plug the organisms into there, and basically you'll be able to actually give them their trophic levels, and you'll be able to notice again how they're operating at several trophic levels at once. So, for instance, you've got the spiders uh, feeding at several levels uh, and you've got uh, rabbits only feeding at one level. Um, and let's just have a look at the trophic levels here. So, basically, uh, as you get towards the top, you find that often organisms are actually feeding at several trophic levels. You can also show ecosystem energy transfer in the form of a pyramid. Um, and so this is a pyramid of energy. Um, and you can see it's really just reiterating in graphical form uh, what we were talking about just now, that the amount of energy available reduces sharply. And so that typical pyramidal shape 
uh, is actually uh, a classic there. However, it is an oversimplification. So it works well for terrestrial ecosystems, and it works reasonably well for some aquatic and marine ecosystems. But just have a look at other complications. So basically, what you've got uh, over on the left-hand side uh, is something that could give you an inverted pyramid. And this is a pyramid of numbers. So if you think of an ecosystem based on a single oak tree, that's how small ecosystems can be. In fact, they can be even smaller than that. Uh, basically, the single tree could be fed on by several birds and the birds might have lots and lots of parasites, fleas or lice. It could be even more inverted than that. You could have a single tree being fed on by a lot of caterpillars and the caterpillars are then fed on by birds and so then you start to get more of a diamond shaped pyramid. And uh, if you look in the middle, you've got the pyramid of biomass. Now, pyramids of biomass tend to follow the shape of pyramids of energy because energy and biomass are basically talking about the amount of energy available and what it's used for. But if you go over to the right-hand side, the pyramid of energy, um, you won't actually get uh, the same tendency towards the inverted pyramids when you get into marine ecosystems, usually. But it's not impossible. So all I want you to do is to just be aware that these pyramids need to be treated with respect and not treated as ends in themselves, but just used as ways for you to demonstrate to other people. Um, and if you're doing a seminar, for instance, you could show a, a pyramid uh, which might be inverted, it might be diamond-shaped, it might be spindle-shaped, uh, or it might be a straightforward pyramid. And the final thing I just want to look at today, just briefly, um, is human impact on ecosystems. If you're following the unit, uh, uh, which is the laser unit, uh, on evolution and ecosystems, it's criterion 1.3. And obviously humans can impact ecosystems a lot. And usually if you speak to students and you say, what's the human in impact on ecosystems? Uh, they immediately think of extinction rebellion and they think of climate change and they think of global warming. Let's put those to one side. There are lots and lots of other ways that humans can impact on ecosystems. Some of them bad some of them neutral, some of them quite good. So there's just a list there of some of the things. And I won't bother reading through it. I'm just going to look at uh, three of those um, and just briefly consider uh, the aspects of them. So the ones I want to look at um, are land use, pollution and mining. Um, so if we start off with pollution, first of all, just to be awkward, um, quite often in happier times, uh, students will take, when there's no coronavirus around, I mean, uh, the students uh, will take samples from the River Great Ouse, which flows uh, from somewhere in Oxfordshire uh, and eventually through Bedford uh, and out towards East Anglia. And what we do is we start off with a hypothesis that as the water f flows through the built-up area of Bedford, uh, the water quality will deteriorate. And so we look at quite a number of parameters that you can see there. Um, and you can see on the particular occasion that we did it, we uh, tested for clarity, not much change there, until you get to region E, which strangely is as you're leaving Bedford. Um, but also you've got uh, nitrate levels and phosphate levels. And it's nitrate and phosphate that I just want to concentrate on just for a moment um, because they're good examples of how 
human activity can impact on aquatic ecosystems and water quality in general. So where do these nitrates and phosphates come from? Well, lots of different sources because of course nitrogen and phosphorus uh, form part of all living organisms and so you'll find uh, nitrate and phosphate levels may be high due to raw sewage or slurry. Slurry is uh, from farms uh, or from faeces from animals uh, running off into nearby streams or rivers or ponds or lakes and also agrochemicals themselves. So nitrate fertilizer, for instance, is commonly used, NPK fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphate, uh, and also potassium, of course. And these are excellent growth nutrients. So if farmers want to nourish their crops and get them producing heavy yields, they will tend to use nitrogen-rich fertilizers in a lot of cases. And of course, detergents as well are a rich source of phosphate, but also nitrate as well. So these can readily pass through, uh, through sewage works and then into uh, water supplies uh, in nearby rivers and so forth. And this is the problem, runoff. So um, basically any of these nitrates and phosphates uh, will sooner or later run off into a body of water nearby and then ultimately finish up in the sea. And the runoff may be surface runoff, so it may be from um, you know, heavy rainfall washing the nitrate and phosphate uh, through the ground into a river or a stream or a pond. Uh, alternatively, the nitrates and phosphates may sink down into the deeper groundwater, but which again will drain into nearby bodies of water. So sooner or later it all finishes up in the same place. And the problem with nitrate and phosphate um, is actually that they're too good at stimulating growth. That's why farmers use them. And so if you get nitrate and phosphate entering a body of water, uh, they will actually lead to a rapid overgrowth of algae uh, and also pond-side plants as well, riverside plants. And algae particularly have a very short life cycle. They die, uh, they sink down into the water, the remains sink into the water and start to rot and they're decayed by the activity of water living aerobic bacteria and the bacteria multiply like crazy because there's so much food for them and in doing so they actually take up too much of the dissolved oxygen from the water leading to semi-anaerobic conditions forming. And the result of this is to actually cause beneficial species, aerobic species that live in water, fish, beneficial insects, to actually die and move away. That's eutrophication. This is a little case study which you'll be looking at. It's on Moodle um, and if we get time uh, and allowing for the technology, we'll have to do it remotely, uh, we'll actually use this uh, as part of the assessment for the unit. But I'll tell you more about that later. A final type of pollution that I want to look at is thermal pollution. Industrial processes and factories and power stations uh, are basically often using water to cool processes down and they then return that warmed water back to nearby rivers and streams. They're not supposed to, but uh, it still happens. And that leads to a warming uh, of the water. So the water above the industrial plant uh, might be five degrees cooler than the water below the industrial plant where warm water is being discharged into it. And the big problem is that when you warm water, you reduce the oxygen holding capacity. And so you get a lower oxygen content, 
similar things happen, can happen, uh, to eutrophication in that the uh, aerobic species uh, either die or move away. This is a diagram from an Open University course and it just shows how as you go along a length of river from left to right pollution levels can actually act. So the top graph is just showing the levels of suspended solids and imagining that there's a sewage outfall where the red arrow is uh, and suspended solids, uh, untreated sewage entering the stream here uh, and you can see the red dotted line shows that the amount of suspended matter increases uh, and it also shows if you look at the blue line there that the oxygen levels start to drop sharply and only recover later on a mile or two down the river uh, usually due to either diffusion from the atmosphere or due to the turbulence of the water. Now if you look down at the second graph, uh, no, I tell a light, the third graph, um, you can actually see what's happening there. So the black dotted line in graph C shoots up at the same time that the sewage comes in. This is the multiplication of bacteria, all that lovely grub just arriving from the sewage outfall and they start to multiply like crazy. And if you look, you'll see that as they peak, the levels of oxygen start to drop like a stone in the top graph, the blue line. Now if you also look on the top graph, you'll see a line, a black line called BOD biochemical oxygen demand, uh, that is the demand made for oxygen from the water. So obviously if that's high, the amount of oxygen will be low. Middle graph, B, chemical concentrations, only going to look at one, NO3, nitrate. Phosphate's pretty much the same. Um, and so what you've got there is uh, an increase of nitrate levels somewhat after the level of introduction. And what's actually had to happen um, is that the amino acids uh, and the proteins in the suspended solids have to be broken down first of all to actually release the nitrogen in the form of NO3 and nitrate. So it has to go through the nitrogen cycle but then you get this huge peak of nitrate. Uh, and if you look down to the graph below, you'll see that as that rises, so does the level of algae rise before falling away again. So all of these things become related together and it can be quite complex trying to trace uh, the interaction between the different processes. The final uh, thing I want to look at is uh, the combination of land use and mining. Uh, so I've sort of lumped together two of those things from the list that we saw. Um, first of all, land use. Well, uh, everybody wants to build more houses apparently, uh, although I think the developers more than anybody. Uh, and of course that covers ground with concrete and roads. And when you cover the surface of the earth with impermeable matter. That means that there's no penetration of water and that can actually have effects on the availability of water uh, in the water table some way down. You also find that if you've got concrete, not only do you get no water under the concrete or very little water under the concrete, um, but you also get substantial runoff and so you get a runoff of water away from the town and that will cause problems somewhere else. It could be in a stream or a river. Um, and of course the concrete and the tarmac and the road surfaces uh, could actually contain pollutants such as 
uh, sodium chloride salt uh, spread on the roads in the winter to uh, try and delay freezing uh, and icing up of the roads. That then gets washed off into nearby streams. And of course, salt, sodium chloride, has severe osmotic effects on organisms. So you can again get problems in nearby fresh water. In terms of mining, uh, in Bedfordshire, we've, we've had our fair share of mining. We've got brickyards uh, of the past uh, and big, huge uh, quarries uh, where the Oxford clay was and the London clay were actually extracted to turn into bricks. Um, we've also had the mining of Fuller's Earth for centuries. And Fuller's Earth is a type of clay, uh, a Montmorillonite clay, and it's very absorbent and it's got a range of industrial applications uh, and also applications in things like cat litter. So up until a, relatively recently, cat litter employed Fuller's Earth. And after a lot of environmental concerns were raised from these huge, uh, huge quarry operations, and we've got a picture of one here. Uh, you can see really deep pits uh, with heavy machinery removing the substratum. Um, and a lot of these have now ceased operation. They've been restored. And the restored ones, uh, this is a picture of that same quarry uh, just taken just within five years of it ceasing to exist. Uh, and obviously the overburden, the, the soil, topsoil was replaced. Um, and since the picture of the yellow gorse, uh, further work has been done and replanting on a large scale has also been done. That's given rise to an interesting study as well because uh, we suffer from a lot of deer in this area which were formerly escapees from uh, notable um, grand houses of the past and these deer were introduced there. They're actually alien deer uh, 100 or 200 years ago and obviously they got out into the wild um, and they do a lot of grazing and so the first attempt at planting trees um, was pretty much a waste of time. So then the uh, estate developers, uh, meaning the, uh, the tree planters, uh, fenced round with deer-proof fencing. And it's very interesting to actually see the difference in the vegetation inside the enclosures, which are several 20, 30 acres in size. Uh, compared to that outside, which is still grazed by deer. Uh, quite an interesting ecological study in succession there. Also, of course, chalk quarries. Uh, chalk quarries, very similar sort of situation. Uh, chalk is mined or quarried uh, for use in the building trade, uh, for making lime and also cement.